In the Old Testament, Jesus said, all who hate me love death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Accepting him as your Lord and Savior and choosing to follow him puts you on the way. Obeying the truth of God's word keeps you on the way, the way that ends in eternal life. Your eternal destiny will be determined by your choices in this world. Steps to Life exists to help people find the way, the truth, and the life. You ready for Jesus to come? As you know, the time is going to come. When he's going to come whether you're ready or not. So Jesus said, be ready. Before we study this morning, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we're going to study. Father in heaven, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher as we read from your word. You'll help us to understand what we need to do to be ready for Jesus to come. Help us to understand the preparation that is absolutely necessary if we want to greet our Lord in peace and with joy. Teach us the truth from your word now as we open and read it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to study with you this morning about the components, the components of sanctification, or sanctification is a great big theological word that just means Holiness or being holy, that's what that word means. To sanctify something is to make it holy. Sanctification is the equivalent of holiness. To be sanctified is to be holy. But before we look at that subject, I want to read to you several verses from the Bible so that you'll see how vitally important this is. We're living in an age, I'm very sorry to have to say this, but it's even true since 19, late 1970s, it's even true in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that there are preachers and there are congregations and many people who are Seventh-day Adventists that somehow think that sanctification is an accessory. And they say, well, you're saved by justification alone. And it's good to be sanctified, but they think that, that it's justification that saves you. Well, is sanctification connected with salvation to the extent that it is necessary or you cannot be saved. Let's read several texts from the Bible. Let's read first, first of all, let's read from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. All right? God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. We could read many other texts explaining the meaning of that, but we won't. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the first chapter. Verses 15 to 17. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. So, holiness is one of the main themes of the book of first letter, first Peter. Let's look at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1. This is a very fascinating verse. Ephesians 1, 4. It says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him 
in love. Now, God created Adam and Eve with the ability to procreate so that they would have children, and then those children would have children, and then those children would have children, and as that would keep going on, the population of the world would keep increasing until the whole world would be populated. Now, let me ask you a question. You better not delve into this. This is, this is you can, your mind get to going on this, and it's, you, you, won't, you can't go to sleep at night when you really get to going on this one. Did God know before he created Adam and Eve how many children they're going to have? You think he did? Well, did he know how many children Adam and Eve's children would have? You think he did? Well, let me ask you this. When you get to the 50th or the 100th generation, do, would God know how many people there would be and how many children they would have? You think God knew that? This text says that he did. Not only did he know that, he knew which ones of Adam and Eve's children would accept the gospel. That's very evident in this verse. God knew. He's writing to the people in Ephesus that have accepted the gospel, those that are saints, he says, there are holy ones in Christ Jesus. And he said, before the foundation of the world, God chose you. He knew you, chose you. I didn't bring the statement with me. It's in volume 7 of the testimonies about, I don't know, in the 20s. And it's talking about this same subject. And it says, God counted up his work. You know when God counted up his workers? <laughs> Way back there, thousands of years ago, he looked down the generations. He looked clear, clear to the end of time. In every generation, he knew who the ones would be that would accept the truth and be his children and be his workers. God knew you. God knew about you before the foundation of the world. And it was his decision, it was his will that you should be holy. That's to be sanctified, to be holy, without blame before him in love. Before the foundation of the world, God determined that. That's what this text says. Let's look at another one. Look at 2 Thessalonians. The second chapter and verse 13. Now, this is a very powerful verse. I think of this verse whenever theologians tell me that salvation is by justification alone. I think of this verse. Look at this verse. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. The same thing, same thing he's saying in Ephesians 4. God knew who it was in Thessalonica who would accept the truth. He knew it clear from the beginning of the world. He knew that. And he says he chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Notice, the people that are chosen for salvation are chosen to be saved by sanctification through this, in the Spirit and belief in the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. We're just going to look right now at one more. Look in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Now, this is a hard verse, especially hard when you're reading it to somebody that's in the hospital, suffering, somebody that's sick, somebody that's going through trials that they can't understand and don't explain, but it's still in the Bible. Oftentimes, I do not read this verse to people who are suffering trials because I'm afraid that they won't be able to stand it. They won't be able to take it. But it's in the Bible. It's Hebrews 12.10. It says, They indeed, that's our earthly fathers, 
for a few days chastened us, that's punished us, as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Why does God allow trials to come to his children? Oh, the only trials he allows to come to his children are those that are going to be for their profit, so th and that will help them to be a partaker of his holiness. If you want to be holy, you have to be willing to endure discipline, <laughs> trials. And how important is this that you and I become holy people? How important is this? Well, let's go on down the chapter. Go on down to verse 14. It says, pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Now that is a powerful verse. I have preached about that verse many times before, and it's worth preaching about many times. If I am not holy, am I going to see the Lord? No. No. I will perish when the Lord appears if I'm not a holy person. So I want to be a holy person. Do you want to be a holy person? Well, let's... Forgive me. Give me, give me a chance to read you one more verse on holiness, okay? Uh, this is a really interesting one. One of my favorite ones. Look in Acts uh, 26. Now this contains the story of when Jesus Christ appeared and had a personal interview with Saul of Tarsus when he was on the Damascus Road. And it was, his appearance was brighter than the sun. And... Saul of Tarsus had eye trouble from then on for the rest of his life. Even though Lord, he took the scales off his eyes so he could see, he had eye trouble for the rest of his life. The appearance was brighter than the sun. And when Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road, he made, he not told him not only why he was appearing to him, but he told him what he was going to do and what his mission was. He declared to Paul, He's Saul of Tarsus, who was to become Paul, he declared to him what his mission was to be, and he gave him, he gave him a seven-point outline of what his mission was to be. Right then, on that one, on that one visit, Jesus gave the Apostle Paul a seven-point outline what he was going to do for the rest of his life, what his mission was going to be. Let's see what it was. Look in verse 18. Number one, he says, I'm going to, the Lord says, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Number one, to open their eyes. Number two, to turn them from darkness to light. Number three, from the power of Satan to God. Number four, that they might receive forgiveness of sins. Number five, and an inheritance among those who are, number six, sanctified. That's holy people. And then how they're sanctified is number seven, by faith in me. So the Lord gave to Saul of Tarsus on that interview at the Damascus Road a seven-point outline of what he was going to do for the rest of his life. And he said he was going to enable the Gentiles to turn from the power of Satan to the power of God and from darkness to light, and they're going to receive forgiveness of sins, and they're going to receive an inheritance among those that are sanctified by faith in me. Who's going to receive the eternal inheritance? The people that are sanctified by faith in Jesus. That's who it's going to be. So, we want to be sanctified if we want to be saved. So we need to study about sanctification, what it is. And so let's spend a few minutes studying what is 
this sanctification? What are the components of sanctification? Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was a sanctified person? Yes, he was. He was the pattern man. The pattern man. So you can learn everything that you need to understand about sanctification by studying and learning to know Jesus Christ. He is the pattern man. He was perfectly sanctified. The Bible says concerning him that he was holy and harmless and undefiled. But the interesting thing about the life of Jesus, when you study it and you read in your Bible, when Jesus dwelt among men, now remember, he was perfectly sanctified. He was a perfectly sanctified man. He was a perfect man. But was he accepted by the people in this world? No, he was not. And he told his disciples before he left, he says, it's going to be the same with you that has been with me. Let's just read that. Look in John, the 15th chapter. Verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Okay. And then he says in verse 23... If you hate me, the person that hates me hates my father too. There is no such thing as saying you believe in God, but you don't love Jesus Christ. You believe in God, but you don't follow Jesus. There's no such thing. Now, there's millions of people in our world today, in fact, over a billion, that think that you can do that. They think that they'll, they'll tell you that, well, Jesus was a good man. No, no, no. Jesus was not just a good man. If Jesus was not God himself, if Jesus was not a divine person, he was one of the most wicked men that ever lived because he would be a liar. And Jesus told the Jews, I've thought about this text so often when I'm dealing with people who are confused and mixed up with Arian theology. And I pray for these people that they won't be lost. Because Jesus said to the Jews, this is in John 8, 24, he said, if you do not believe that I am, you know what that word I am means? That word signifies the eternal presence of God. It does not signify somebody that came out from the Father some time back in eternity. The, the phrase I am signifies the eternal presence of God. That's saying, I am self-existent. Ellen White says over and over again that Jesus Christ was self-existent. And he says, if you do not believe that I am, by the way, in English translations, they add the word he. Jesus didn't use the word he. That's an added word. And that, that confuses people. All that's in the Greek text is, if you do not believe that I am, You'll die in your sins. Do you want to die in your sins? But they didn't accept him. And there are millions of people, religious people today, that don't accept him. And this is something we need to try to understand. How is it that a perfect man... You remember one time, Jesus? this is in John 8, too, Jesus said, which of you convicts me of sin. And did they have anything to say? No, they didn't. So he's a perfect man. He's harmless. He's undefiled. And he's holy. And he's not accepted. Here's my question. Why? What was it about Jesus? What was it about him so that they didn't accept him? It had to do with his holiness. That's why they didn't accept him. Before we go on, and I explain that, let me just ask you a quick question. <laughs> if you are a holy person, are you going to be accepted in this world? 
No, the world's just the same today as it was in Jesus' day. Jesus was not accepted because he was a holy person. And I'm going to explain to you what aspect of his holiness it was that resulted in the world not accepting him, and that's the same thing that will result in your life too. I'm going to read it to you. I think Eleanor White explained it one time better than I can explain it. So I'm going to read to you how this happened. She says, Our Savior was the light of the world, but the world knew him not. He was constantly employed in works of mercy, shedding light upon the pathway of all. Yet he did not call upon those with whom he mingled to behold his unexampled virtue. His self-denial, self-sacrifice, and benevolence. The Jews did not admire such a life. They considered his religion worthless. What did the Jews consider the religion of Jesus to be? Worthless. They considered his religion to be worthless. Well, why? I just read to you what he did. He's going around doing works of mercy. He's doing good. He's helping people. And he's never trying to draw attention to himself or what he's doing. He's just helping the people and blessing the people. And the people are happy when they're healed and they're made whole. And everybody, everybody's unhappy with him. The Jews are unhappy with him. They, they say his religion is worthless. Why? Let, let, let me read on. They considered his religion worthless because it did not accord with their standard of piety. <laughs> they don't think that he, he is a pious person because they had rules. And they said, according to our rules, he's not a religious person. He's not a pious person. He, in fact, they said one time, we have, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought, to, he ought to be put to death. He said, they decided that Christ was not religious in spirit or character. What do you think of that? They decided, the Jews decided that Jesus was not religious. Now remember, this is a man who is perfect. He is perfectly sanctified. He is holy. He is undefiled. He's doing nothing but helping the people. The sick are overjoyed anywhere, anytime they can get near him. They know they're going to get healed. And by the way, when Jesus healed people, he didn't just heal their bodies. He healed their minds. He healed their spirit, their soul. And yet the Jews said, he's not religious. By the way, when, you, when I hear that, I say, well, what, what is religious? Well, here's what their religion was. They decided that Christ was not religious in spirit or character, for their religion consisted in display, in praying publicly, and in doing works of charity for effect. So they had a religion that involved doing all sorts of things, including going to church on Sabbath and paying tithes and offerings and doing good works and all, all sorts of things. And they wanted to be sure that somebody saw them do these good things so that they'd know how good they were. Jesus didn't put on a display. In fact, one place Ellen White says that his works of his miracles were done in as quiet a manner as possible. And so they said he's not religious. And she says they trumpeted their good deeds as do those who claim sanctification. They would have all understand that they are without sin. The Jews wanted everybody to understand that they were religious and that they were without sin. The people that were the most religious people in the world who claimed that they were without sin crucified the Son of God. He says, the whole life of Christ was in direct contrast to this. He sought neither gain nor honor. His wonderful acts of healing were performed in as quiet a manner as possible. Although he could not restrain the enthusiasm of those who were the recipients of his great blessings. And now she's going to tell you why it was that they rejected Jesus and didn't want anything to do with him. Now listen to this. 
humility, and meekness characterized his life. And it was because of his lowly walk and unassuming manners, which were in such marked contrast to their own, that the Pharisees would not accept him. Why would they not accept him? It's because of his humility, his meekness, his unassuming manners. He told the people, he said, don't tr send a trumpet, sound a trumpet before you when you do all them so that you may be seen. If, if you do that, you won't even have any reward of your Father in heaven. You just have reward of men. They didn't like to hear that because that's what they were doing. Look at, let's look at a couple of texts. Look in Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek. That's the, that word translated meek can be translated gentle or humble. And Jesus said here in this verse, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's think through that text for just a moment. Ask, let me ask you this question. Is there coming a time when every single person living in this world will be meek. Is there coming a time like that? Yes, there is, because the people that aren't meek won't be here anymore. They will not have eternal life. They will not inherit the earth. They won't be here. The only people in the whole world will be meek. But meekness is not popular today, just like it wasn't in Christ's day. Look what Jesus said about it in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, somebody might say, well, you said you're going to talk about the components of sanctification. All you've talked about is one thing. Did you know that Ellen White says that meekness is the most, let me read it, the most precious fruit of sanctification is the grace of meekness. That is the most precious, the most important component of sanctification is meekness. Well, let's spend just a few minutes looking at it. By the way, we read it already, so I don't need to, to prove it, I hope, to you. Meekness is something that you and I cannot generate. To actually be meek requires a creative act. And because it requires a creative act, nobody can be meek unless the Holy Spirit recreates within that person a new mind and a new spirit. And that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, there's no chance for you to be saved unless you're born again. Because unless the Holy Spirit implants a new spirit, a new mind in, my, in, in me, then I will not be me. It's not something that I can make happen. Remember, the Bible is very clear that the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. It's through the Holy Spirit that we are sanctified. And unless the Holy Spirit works in my mind to create a new mind, a new spirit in me that is meek, I won't be meek. When I was in college, and this is an Adventist college, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to tell it, say it. When I was in college, there was actually a person on the, factor, on the faculty, it was reported that he was proud of his humility. And when I heard that, I said, I've never heard a bigger deception, bigger delusion, more of a fraud in my life.
Meekness was not popular or common in Christ's day, and it is not in our day, but it is a necessary component of the character of anybody that's going to be sanctified. I want to look briefly first at 11 and then at three more things that meekness will do in your life. Total of 14. So here's the 11. Here's what will happen. When this grace, that's meekness, presides in the soul, the disposition is molded by its influence. That's number one. It changes my disposition. By the way, have you ever seen or heard anybody that needs a change in their disposition? You ever seen that? You can't force it to happen. There are some people that have sour dispositions. There's some people that have cranky dispositions, angry dis. You can't change that. But let me tell you something. If a person surrenders to the Holy Spirit and says, Lord, I want to be born again, when the Holy Spirit starts working in a person's life, a change happens in their disposition. Do you want to have the Holy Spirit work in your life so you have a change in your disposition? That's the first result of meekness, it, as a change in the disposition. I have to pray to the Lord, say, Lord, I realize my disposition is not right. My natural disposition is not right. I need to be changed. I need the Holy Spirit to work in my life so that I have a different disposition. Now, we all have different dispositions, but the natural disposition of the sinful man and woman is not correct ever. The Holy Spirit has to change it. We, ha it has a change. we have to have a change in our disposition. That's one of the first things. That's the first thing Ellen White mentions that happens when a person becomes meek. They have a change in their disposition. My dear friends, that's what I want. Is that what you want? I don't want my natural disposition. I want my disposition to be changed. That's the first thing. Here's number two. Number two. There is a continual waiting upon God and a submission to His will. I'm submitted. I'm surrendered to God's will when I become meek. I'm not saying, well, I'm going to do it my way. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm all done with that. Say, Lord, I want to do things your way, not my way. What's your will, Lord? If your will is completely opposite than mine, I want to do your will. It's the second thing that happens when a person becomes meek. First, their dispositions completely change. Secondly, they submit their will to God's will. I've told you this story before, but it's worth repeating so you can think it through in your mind. We had a wonderful neighbor. He was not a, a Christian as far as I know. He was a wonderful man. I don't think he's alive anymore. When we lived in Texas, and uh, I admired this man because he had the, I admired he and his wife both. In fact, we even took his wife to evangelistic meeting, I believe, one time. He used to tell me, he was a mechanical sort of a person. And, uh, of course, he could do all kinds of things with mechanical things that I didn't know how to do. He had a shop out by his house. And, uh, you know, you know, sometimes when you go downtown and you buy things and it's something and it's not put together, you have to come home and you have to put it together. You've all been in that situation, right? You bought something downtown and it comes in a box, but it's all, you, you have to assemble it and put it together. I remember he'd tell me, he was telling me about this thing he bought that he had to put together. And, and he said, uh, he gave the directions, but he says, I didn't follow their directions. He says, I did it my way. I put it together my way. Now, that's all right when you're putting something together that you got from Sears and Roebuck. But let me tell you, in terms of religion, it's not right for me to say to the Lord, I'm going to do it my way. And that's the problem, one of the biggest problems in the religious world today. The Lord says, for example, I want you to meet with me on my holy day. And people say, no, I'm not going to do that, Lord. I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it on the first day of the week. I'm going to do it when I want to do it. That's not meek. Will is not submitted to God's will. That's number two. Here's number three. Now, this is astonishing. It says, the understanding grasps every divine truth. That is amazing. 
when, when you have the first two things happen, then when you start reading your Bible, you start to understand things. Because <laughs> your will is submitted to God's will, and the Holy Spirit starts teaching you when you're reading your Bible. So you start to understand things when you read your Bible. That's wonderful, isn't it? Here's the fourth thing that happens. The will bows to every divine precept. So I understand divine things, and when I see what it says, I start doing it. That's the fourth characteristic of meekness. Here's the fifth characteristic of meekness. When I read something in God's Word and I start to do it, I do it without murmuring. Oh, Lord, yes, I'm going to follow health reform if it kills me. You ever heard somebody say that? What craziness. Health reform is a blessing. I remember when a girl at Southwestern Adventist College, and uh, she came to my office because I was teaching the course in, in health science, and she was in, uh, a student in the course, and, and uh, she said to me, uh, you're not going to take my meat away from me. I said, no, I'm not going to try to take your meat away from you. Eat all you choose. The only problem is the people that do that, they also have the consequences of it. When a person's meek and they find out what God says, they do it, and they're not complaining about, it. oh, no, I have to eat. That's what, that's what kept the children of Israel in the wilderness so they couldn't go into the promised land. They're complaining all the time about health reform diet. They didn't realize that how wonderful it was that there wasn't anybody in their whole. The Bible says there wasn't a single one of them that was feeble or sick. Here we're going to go through fast, 6 and 7. Here's 6 and 7 effect, result of meekness. True meekness softens and subdues the heart. My dear friend, do you know anybody who's not soft-hearted, who's not tender-hearted? You, you know anybody like that? That's because they're not meek. If I have meekness, my heart will become soft and tender. Jesus was so meek. His heart was so soft and so tender that when he was in a group of people and the children saw him, they wanted to be near him, and they ran up to him, and they climbed up on his lap. Ellen White says one time she saw in vision that he, he was holding children on his lap and they were so relaxed, one of them just fell asleep right there. They felt perfectly secure. Because he was gentle. Meekness softens and subdues the heart. That, that softens is number six, subdues is number seven. We'll never get through all these if I don't hurry. But that one about having a heart that is subdued is worth doing a little meditation upon because it's very rare in the world today. It's even rare in the church among Christians. But we need to pray that we will become sanctified. Becoming sanctified, one the most precious grace of sanctification is meekness. And if I am meek, my heart will become softened it will, and subdued. Number eight, this is related to a couple of the others we studied already. Meekness gives the mind a fitness for the engrafted word. My mind becomes fit, ready to accept what I read in God's word. When I read it, I want it. You know people that when they read the word of God, they don't want what they're reading. They, they would rather resist it. You know that? But when I become meek and I read the Word, I realize that this is wonderful and this is what I want. My mind is fit to accept what I read. Number nine, here is a ninth consequence of meekness. It brings the thoughts into obedience to Jesus Christ. 
We could read that from the Bible because it says in 2 Corinthians 10 12 that every thought is to bring it into captivity to Christ. That's one of the results of meekness. My thoughts are brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. My thoughts are brought into harmony with Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to dwell on this. We ha we're not going to spend time on it, but I'm just going to mention this really quick. The great majority of divorces that are happening all over the country, the bottom line problem is one or both of the people, their thoughts are not brought into obedience to Christ. And as a result, there's difference and clashing and lust and, and all kind of sinful desires and that eventually just bust the home apart. Sometimes somebody says, oh, did you hear so-and-so? It just happened suddenly. Oh, no. A home never busts apart suddenly. That never happens. There's always a long process that takes place in the minds of people, a long time before that happens. But when I'm meek, then it says, my thoughts are brought into obedience to Jesus Christ. And number 10, my heart is open. When I'm meek, my heart is open. What is it open to? Let me read it. it op this meekness opens the heart to the Word of God. So my heart is open to God's Word. And when I hear it or when I read it, I immediately accept it. Now, Jesus said, has something to say about this to the Jews. Notice what he said to them. This is John, the eighth chapter. Verse 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Still a problem today. If I'm not meek, and I'm not ready to hear God's word, because i got my own agenda, my own thoughts, my own plans, every, my, my own everything. But when I'm meek, I'm surrendered to God's will, His plans, His word, and my heart is open to what He has to say to me. Number 11, when I'm meek, I come to God's Word in the same way that Mary came to God's Word. You remember what happened when Jesus visited Lazarus and Mary and Martha's home? Do you remember what happened? Martha was out preparing dinner. Nothing wrong with that. But Mary, she had such a hunger to know what Jesus was going to teach her that she's she just sat there right by his feet because she wanted to learn. I learned a long time ago in evangelism. Nobody can be converted until they're willing to come to God's Word as a learner. Many people read God's Word in order to argue something, to build a case, to do this. There are people that know the Bible from beginning to end, but they're not followers of the Lord. They won't be in the kingdom of heaven. They're not, they don't come to the Word of God as a learner. Lord, what do you want me to... We're going to run out of time. I have a whole bunch of examples here from the Bible of that situation. When Jesus appeared to Paul or Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road, he just said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's the right attitude. When I come to the Word of God and say, Lord, what do you want to teach me? What do you want me to do? That's the meek attitude. And the Holy Spirit will teach you then. But the Holy Spirit can't teach you if you don't have the attitude of a learner. Those are 11 results of meekness. Now, remember, meekness is a grace of sanctification that is produced in a person's life not by their own will. You cannot sanctify yourself. You can sanctify your body by cleaning it up, but you can't sanctify your mind. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And when the Holy Spirit 
sanctifies your mind and gives you the grace of meekness. I'm going to cover now three other results. We've covered 11. I'm going to cover now three other results that will happen when the Holy Spirit creates meekness within my heart, my mind. Number one, the last three. We're just about done. Meekness is a grace wrought by the Holy Spirit as a sanctifier and enables its possessor at all times to control a rash and impetuous temper. Now that is an amazing statement. I'll repeat it. Meekness is a grace wrought by the Holy Spirit as a sanctifier and enables its possessor at all times to control a rash and impetuous temper. Oh, my dear friends, there are so many lives that get ruined over and over and over again because we're rash, we're impetuous, and we're not in control. And it wrecks people's lives on the job. It wrecks people's lives at home. It wrecks people's lives with their relatives. One, per, one time a person said to me, well, I just say what I think. And I said to myself, that's the trouble. By the way, would you like to be in this kind of condition? Would you like the recording angel to be able to put on your page in the book of life? And say, this person has received from the Holy Spirit the grace of meekness, and at all times, they're in control of their temper. They're, they used to be rash, but now they're in control. Would you like that to be written on your page in the book of life? If you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit creates the grace of meekness in your mind and your heart, that's what will happen. You'll be in control. By the way, this is one of the awful things that happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned. They lost self-control. Before that, they had perfect self-control, and that's one of the awful things that was lost as soon as they sinned. Do you remember what Ellen White says they did? As the very same day they sinned, she says, they started reproaching one another. They were finding fault with each other. It's your fault. You did this. It, they were doing that in the Garden of Eden the very day that after they sinned, that same day they started doing that, justifying themselves and blaming the other one. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, no chance for you unless the Holy Spirit creates a new spirit in you unless you're born again. And my dear friend, it's the same thing that was true for Nicodemus is true for you and true for me. There's no chance for us to be in the kingdom of heaven unless the Holy Spirit recreates within us a new heart, a new spirit, creates within us that quality of meekness so that we are at all times in control of our rash, impetuous temper. Here's number two. Here's a second result of becoming meek. When the grace of meekness is cherished by those who are naturally sour or hasty in disposition. So are there some people that are naturally sour or hasty in disposition? Why, well, you probably know some. It's quite common. Now, here's what will happen. When the grace of meekness is cherished by those who are naturally sour or hasty in disposition, they will put forth the most earnest efforts to subdue their unhappy temper. They will, produce, they will make the most earnest efforts to subdue. What does it mean to subdue? Don't let it be manifested. What does it mean to subdue their unhappy temper? That means that things that they're want to say, they think about it and they say, 
this is not what Jesus would say in my place. I, I, Lord, help me not say it. How, 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 many, how many to quit saying those things? They make the most earnest efforts to subdue their hasty, unhappy temper. You know, when Jesus came around, the people, especially the children, loved to have him come around, and they, they, were, they were eager to listen to what he would say to speak. Now, were the people sinners? Yes, they were sinners. And sometimes Jesus gave very severe rebukes. But Ellen White says that when he gave those severe rebukes, that there were tears in his, uh, in his voice. They understood that it hurt him to have to say those things, but he wanted them to be saved. They weren't worried that the disciples were never worried, no matter what they did. They knew after a while, they knew that no matter what happened, that Jesus would never lose his temper. He just never did. And here is the last, here is the last consequence of meekness. This is number 14 of the three in the second set. And this is an amazing statement by Ellen White about this. Absolutely astonishing. Listen to this. It says, this is a person that becomes meek. The Holy Spirit's created meekness in their heart and mind. She says, every day they will gain self-control. So they gain more and more and more self-control every day until that which is unlovely and unlike Jesus is conquered. Amazing. Every day, the person that's meek, every day he is gaining more self-control until everything that is not like Jesus in his life, in his speech, is conquered. And when that happens, and the recording angel looks at that person, the recording angel writes down on that person's page, this person's character is a reflection of the character of Jesus Christ. Do you want that to happen in your life? My dear friends, God doesn't lie. The recording angel will never record that on my page unless it's true. The Bible says it's impossible for God to tell a lie. He won't lie. The recording angel will not write that opposite my name unless it's true. I want it to become true in my case. How about you? You want that to become true in your case? Well, I said we were going to look at the components of sanctification. We've only looked at one, but we looked at what Ellen White says is the most precious, the most important one. You want to become meek? You want to become gentle? Christ, that's what's involved in becoming Christ-like. That's why Christ was not accepted by the world, because he was meek, he was gentle, he was unassuming. That's the way every saved person must become. Before we sing our closing song, let's kneel down and pray that we'll have that experience. Father in heaven, if we look at ourselves, we would despair. And if there's someone here who is discouraged and say, Lord, I'll never make it, Help that person to recognize that the Holy Spirit is all-powerful and that if we surrender our life to the divine agencies, if we acknowledge Jesus as our only Lord and choose to follow Him, that He has promised to give us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will create in us, recreate in us a different heart, a different spirit that is gentle that is lowly, that is unassuming, that is meek, that is Christ-like.
Lord, we cannot create within ourselves a Christ-like spirit. Only you can do that. But we choose to surrender ourselves to your will, to your direction, to your guidance, to your sovereignty, to your lordship, and we earnestly pray that we may each one receive the Holy Spirit and that your Holy Spirit might recreate in us that heart like Adam and Eve had at the beginning before they sinned, that we might become meek, to have a gentle, quiet spirit, to be Christ-like in spirit and character. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way. Thank you.